That was a section from the last movement of my piece Orpheus for Ensemble of Eight Wind and Brass. The music makes reference to several other composers' settings of the Orpheus myth, including those of Monteverdi, Krenik, Stravinsky and Biad Fura. I've come to the viaduct on the Ilm, halfway between Weimar and Schloss Tiefert. This was a favourite spot of Feininger, who I looked at in a previous episode. Although I've come here today because I've been thinking about several other Orpheus settings, including Harrison Birtwell's opera, The Mask of Orpheus, which I have the score of here, which is also referred to in my piece and in the novel I wrote in conjunction with it. Between Eurydice's death in the first ritual ceremony and that of Orpheus by ritual sacrifice in the third and last ritual ceremony, at the centre, dominating Act Two, there are the 17 arches, stretching from the mountainside of the living to that of the dead, from the historical past receding into myth. Each arch comprises the substance of dreams and a vain attempt to bring Eurydice back from the dead, but none of them can prevent the final sacrifice whereby Orpheus shall be slain in Dionysian fashion and consumed, and thereafter transformed into the oracle. Bert Whistle's opera is a remarkable piece, but there's also another Orphic saga on my mind, Orpheus Behind the Wire by Hans Werner Henze, a set of settings for chamber choir by Edward Bond. The fourth movement for male chorus is entitled It Was Changed. Old now, more strings on this lyre than hairs on my head. I lean on the tree and sit in the grass to look down on the river. It shines like the scales on a fish. Old now, but Plato had said that all perceptions of beauty are a vision of perfection. Mathematical beauty and moral beauty and all other forms of beauty remind people of the heavenly realm of perfection from whence they came, and which is never old. All things in the shadowy realm of the real world are merely partial visions of perfection. But beauty is the ultimate form of goodness and a bridge to other worlds of faultlessness. Subsequently, the scholastics, gazing at the same 17 arches, argued that beauty led to perception of holy divinity, until Hamlet warned of the moral corruptions lurking beneath beauty's facade, the fifth arch of dying, and correspondingly the thirteenth arch of knives. But then, in the scales of a fish and the tales of the Orphic Oracle, came the Weimar idealists and Hegel, who presented beauty as a realisation of historical meaning and the purposiveness that led towards absolute freedom and thereafter Nietzsche's Dionysian chaos and darkness and destruction set against the Apollonian veil of art and beauty. A lot of the material I've covered in this inquiry has pertained to art and aesthetics, which is not surprising given my own interest in music and aesthetics was shared by many of the figures I've discussed from the classical Weimar era. They recognised, as I do, that discussions about art, which necessarily implies a relationship between the self and any particular piece of art, including any aesthetic judgments made, is reducible to the relationship between mind and nature, between mental realms and material realms. That's not to imply an elimination of art by way of its reduction to psychology, but it is recognition that discussion about art can and should be enhanced, notice the ethical imperative, by discussions about more philosophical issues pertaining to mind and body. Come, press me tenderly to your heart too, but not too hard, the glass may be too thin, it's in the very nature of the thing, for the natural, the world has barely space. What's artificial commands a narrow place. Any discussion about the joys of, for instance, flying far above these arches in a modern aeroplane, inconceivable to Plato, the wondrous views from 10,000 metres and the delights of pressure in the ear as the plane descends and approaches landing, all of these can be enhanced by an understanding of the chemistry and physics of air pressure and the technology of airplane design. It's possible to appreciate how experience is linked to physical changes in the environment, which has a bearing on the meaning of the experience itself. Similarly, the consideration of a remarkable natural landscape 
or the remarkable depiction of a landscape by a Weimar School of Art painter can be enhanced by an understanding of how that experience is linked to other matters beyond the consideration itself, which might in turn have a bearing on the meaning of the experience. Having looked at various contemporary theories pertaining to the relationship between mind and nature, such as epiphenomenalism, behaviorism, and material identity theory, I want to consider a stance towards aesthetic judgments and the meaning of art, which might in turn have bearing on my opera. I want to look at the theories of particularism vis-à-vis -vis generalism. Particularism argues that there are no universal explanations for aesthetic judgments, whereby, for instance, a particular feature may necessarily contribute to quality in one work and severe glitches in another. For instance, the use of irony may benefit a comedy or even the Iphigenic inquiry, but then invalidate a tragedy. Or the use of piano octaves may add dazzling bravura to a set of list variations while, counterfactually, adding incongruity and bemusement to a set of Weben variations. Frank Sibley was a prominent figure among writers on aesthetics during the 1950s and strove to examine the links between the aesthetic and non-aesthetic. He argued, in contravention of the principles of identity, that the aesthetic domain cannot be reduced to or be defined by the non-aesthetic domain and consequently that the comprehension of aesthetic matters cannot be linked with definitive criteria. It requires the exclusive exercises of taste or of aesthetic sensibility. Sibley said, There are no sure-fire rules by which, referring to the neutral and non-aesthetic qualities of things, one can infer that something is balanced, tragic, comic, joyous and so on. One has to look and see. Here, equally, at a different level, I'm saying that there are no sure-fire mechanical rules or procedures for deciding which qualities are actual defects in the work. One has to judge for oneself. And similarly, there are no sure-fire rules preventing emancipation from common tragedy by way of beauty either. Indeed, Edward Bond experienced the London bombings as a child in England during the 1940s, while Hans Werner Henze in Germany was enrolled in the Hitler Youth, trained as a radio officer and required to play a menial role in the war effort before eventually being captured as a prisoner of war. Passing from childhood to youth was difficult. I needed the surgeon's knife. And her? Well, that passion is gentle now. In contrast to the particularist approach, a generalist approach argues that there can be general reasons indicating the merit or other qualities of a work of art, although it concedes a connection between the two is not a simple matter. For instance, it might be possible to argue that consistency is a general feature of merit in, in poetry and music. There may be pieces deserving of merit that are inconsistent, but even then their inconsistency may be seen to create a deeper level of consistency. Works that are genuinely inconsistent are incoherent and accordingly lacking in merit. Coherency is another general indication of merit. Interestingly, Sibley argued that although it's not possible to link aesthetic judgments with non-aesthetic features, which supports this particular stance, this does not in itself rule out the generalist position. He asked his students to consider the linguistic context of aesthetic judgments. He pointed out the links between non-aesthetic and aesthetic features are not comparable to links involving entailment or logical necessity, and consequently should be treated differently. He pointed out that genre judgments are central to aesthetic judgments, which makes them attributive. For instance, the groovy or mellow characteristic of jazz, with its syncopation, polyrhythms and swing notes, are always going to be different to the hip and trendy characteristics of pop music, or to the elegant and graceful sonatas of classical era orchestral music. Each of these descriptions may not transfer across genres, but they have a consistent application within their respective genre. The point he's making raises the issue of the predicative and attributive. If I consider the statement, the music is in C major, and the music is loud, I can see the first is predicative, because it doesn't change from one context to another. A pop song in C major and a Mozart symphony in C major refer to the same thing, the same key, which is set by convention. However, a loud mobile telephone ringtone is not comparable to a loud jet aeroplane even if sometimes it may seem so. The point is, attribution requires a definition of standards, a context, a genre, before any ascertaining of truth conditions. In the same way, aesthetic criteria can be separated into attributive and predicative types. 
the elegant moves of a dancer are not the same thing as, for instance, the elegant moves of alien bacteria in the dancer's bloodstream. In this case, the attributive context introduces an ethical component, a sense of threat in the second example, behind the dissimilarity. The decorum of a vase of freshly picked flowers is not the same thing as the decorum of a vase of plastic flowers, even if they look identical from several metres away. Nevertheless, elegance and decorum are general terms and can be used in a predicative manner. Simply said, humour and dramatic intensity are both inherently general aesthetic merits, though either may be a defect, given appropriate explanation, in the context of a given work. It would be easy to assume that particularists and generalists are talking past each other. The former argues that words change in meaning according to context, and the latter argues that words have fixed meanings but are applied differently according to context. However, the application of hierarchy which underlies this debate reveals a key question. Which comes first in cognition? Language or thought? If I hear music, do I apply a concept to the fixed phenomenal experience of the music, meaning the reality is privileged? Or do I apply a predetermined concept to a variable phenomenal experience of the music, meaning the subjectivity is privileged? In terms of epistemology, is reality a fixed entity upon which we place a conceptual realm, or do the conceptual realms represent a fixed reality upon which we place external input? Is the notion of material identity theory, whereby mind is reducible to physiological brain activity, a fixed reality which thereafter I conceive, or is my ability to conceive the reduction fixed and the notion based upon this? Weimar identity theory equates mind with nature in a manner whereby there is no hierarchy. The intentionality of experience and conceptual logic are deemed to be equivalents. Particularism and generalism represent the same thing. In contrast, the supervenience relationship between mind and nature, outlined in material identity theory, rather than link two entities as the same thing, acts to open up a gulf. Art and music and aesthetics in general are either devalued as mere human constraints or they're devalued for not being human constraints. My music didn't tame beasts. I don't know why men tell such rumours and lies. My music is simple. I strike these notes. That heron, a broke stick in the river, looks once, then goes back to its fishing. But it's true that I went to hell and like you, I lost Eurydice.